My name is Dan Draper. I'm a senior consultant here with PACE, and uh, we are going to talk about doing a Gemba walk today, so uh, we might as well get underway. First, uh, a little bit about PACE. Our mission is to deliver practical organizations to as many, or practical solutions to as many organizations as possible. Basically, PACE stands for Partners in Achieving Change Excellence. So that's what we do. We work with companies to, uh, through organizational transitions, to do lean training, uh, and to bring solutions so that they can be more efficient and more effective. This is just a list of a number of companies that we've trained uh, in the Sudbury and area. Some are mining, obviously some in the public sector. Um, so there's a broad range of companies that we have worked with and have experience um, in working with them. We try and uh, use lean training and the, and the tools associated with lean to improve return on investment. So uh, part of our, our goal is to uh, provide a better return on investment for our clients. Uh, and what we've been able to experience in the human services sector is about five times their investment in our services. Uh, in profitability at their end and in the mining and manufacturing industry, we've gotten as high as 20%. So uh, we're very happy with those results. They, um, and so are our customers. Just so that you know, we are running two green belt training sessions, uh, one at the end of the month and one in September. So if you're interested in uh, getting green belt certification, uh, please make note of these dates. And uh, again, I'll show them at the end of the presentation. So today's topic is the GEMBA. And the GEMBA are, are, is basically a component of the lean process. Uh, when you think of lean, uh, Though there, lean doesn't stand for anything in particular, what the process that you run through in doing a lean analysis of your company is first to recognize that there's an opportunity to do things better. The second phase is really to explore how you can do things better. And going to the Gemba is obviously what is in that venue. It's, um, you know, it gives you an opportunity to measure the current state and determine what, if any, problems exist in your processes. So today we're going to talk about what Gemba is, um, how to do a Gemba walk, uh, what are the considerations when doing one, why do it, some of the golden rules, and what the desired outcomes are. Um, at the same time, we want to talk about planning so that when you go and do your walk in the workplace, uh, you'll be prepared, you'll be able to see what the benefits are, and then today, obviously, uh, we'll summarize our presentation. So, Gemba, in Japanese, it means the actual workplace. Uh, if you're in manufacturing, it's the shop floor. If you're in the hospital sector, it could be out on a ward uh, where the service is actually happening. Um, and it's important that, uh, you know, th those are where the issues that you're trying to solve occur. And it's important to get out there. And you really do have to go and see what's happening on the ground. And there's a, obviously some significant um, considerations when you do that. Um, you know, you're, you're going to be walking around and talking to people. Uh, and one of the biggest things that you have to consider when you are talking to people and talking to them in their workplace is that you may or may not be perceived as interrupting them from the job that they're doing. Uh, you certainly have to come to them with respect. Uh, and you should be prepared beforehand so that you're not uh, wasting any of their time or or, an under, or or not getting the results that you want because it's uh, it's it's a valuable process, but it is also costly to the organization while you're uh, interrupting or at least interacting with a process. So you should have, if you're going to do a walk, uh, you should familiarize yourself with some of the basic process mapping tools that are out there. 
so that you can take a look at the processes that are happening in the organization, um, you know, in the, in the form of inputs and outputs, uh, what processes, what steps are required to provide whatever service or manufacturing process you're trying to do an analysis of. <clears throat> if you have existing metrics for the process that you're doing, um, performance metrics, then it's nice to bring those along. It's also nice to uh, keep an open mind and that there may be new metrics that you want to measure so that if you impart a change in the process, you can measure it. And I think the uh, the other real consideration, again, is the people. You know, how can they be the most helpful to you? Um, and you need to, to understand how, you know, they're going to provide you with different perspectives and varying perspectives and perceptions of what's happening in the workplace. So you have to be ready for that and be able to consider how to incorporate all of that into your final solution. And also, uh, if you're going to do a walk around a, and analyze a workplace uh, issue, uh, it's nice to know who the stakeholders are. So who reports to who, who's accountable for the process that you're looking at, who's supportive, um, who's more or less indifferent, and perhaps who's not as supportive of the process. So it's sort of, uh, you know, that's in the venue of the politics of, of uh, the workplace. But it's important that you have that in the back of your mind when you go in. So the purpose is really to go in and get information um, and get the information as close to the workplace as possible. <clears throat> you can get the facts, the true facts that way. And uh, the intent is to get the most appropriate and most effective practices going in your workplace. So you may be wanting to, well, you're obviously wanting to be more effective in your improvement processes. You'd like to be more efficient. You'd like to see less waste. Whenever there's handoffs between processes in a workplace, there's always some waste, whether it's waiting or um, there's a variety of things that we can talk about uh, in regards to different types of waste to look for. And really, um, It'll help you do, when you're walking through and doing an analysis of the workplace to better to get a better understanding of those business processes. And when you're asking questions and working with people that are actually living the process, you'll get a better buy-in from them. And that's really important. You need employee buy-in uh, and their support to get good data out of, out of your Gemba walk. So the golden rule of GEMBA is pretty straightforward. It's go see. So when a problem rises, go straight to the, to the shop floor, for lack of a better word. And really the main questions you should be asking are why? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Why is there a problem here? Uh, if there's a problem here, what if we did it this way? Uh, you know, and if the answer is yes or no, then again, why? Why isn't it? By, ans by asking probing questions, but simple questions, you can help get to what would be the basically the root of the problem that uh, you're studying. And thirdly, uh, though it should go without saying, it's show respect. Um, you really have to listen to the people. You have to respect that while you're looking at the processes that they've been working on, they probably have ownership to it. Uh, it's not like you're trying to find fault with them and they need to know that fairly clearly. You're just trying to make things better and see how the process could be improved. It's got nothing to do with, uh, with them, uh, but you can bet that they'll perceive that if you don't go in with the right uh, amount of respect and, and some understanding in advance. So doing a gamble walk, I mean, from a planning perspective, you really should know who's involved. Uh, you should know what or who is uh, what or what what is or what are the issues that you want to uh, get a better understanding of. What information you need ahead of time going in. Uh, as I said, whether it's a stakeholder analysis, who's involved in the process, if it's uh, performance metrics from the past showing, uh, you know, decreasing efficiency or effectiveness or errors, that sort of thing and uh, what outcomes you're looking for. So you should have in, in your mind, at least a broad idea of how things can, uh, what outcomes you can look for. 
And to do that, basically, you should be, uh, you know, you really want to look at the purpose uh, of your walk, the, uh, have a good understanding of the people, and finally, uh, be willing to work through the process so that you can do an analysis of that. So really the purpose being, you know, again, understanding uh, what's going on in the workplace. Uh, you either want to validate or map a process that you can do an analysis of it. You want to also identify waste. The people, you need to be, uh, you need to have strong and op open and honest communication with them. They need an understanding of why you're doing this. And uh, I think everyone needs a broad understanding that it's there to improve processes uh, and uh, make their work more efficient and more effective. And for the process, you need to have a plan. If you have tools to assist you in collecting information, have them ready. So um, you may have a process map of the existing process. Um, and that's actually a nice thing to have. You can walk in then and you can make notes as you go through uh, um, your analysis and at the same time you need to keep an open mind the um, and really the ultimate purpose is to eliminate non-value-added work in your workplace that's the main focus of lean and that's actually one of the ultimate purposes of uh, doing a gamble walk um, you want to be able to identify improvement opportunities in a way that clarifies or simplifies your existing processes. That's always a good thing. Making sure that they're easy to follow so that the people that are involved in those processes can sustain the changes that you're trying to make. Um, and you also want your, uh, you want buy-in from the people on the shop floor. And that also speaks to sustainability. So you really also need to identify your target audience. And this again goes back to respect for the people that are working in that, uh, in that process. You know, who's working that day? Um, are there managers and supervisors involved? This goes back basically to your stakeholder analysis. Who's supporting, who's, who's has the authority, um, who is uh, perhaps indifferent and doesn't really need to be involved or can be involved uh, in, a small, uh, in a small way, but doesn't necessarily have to be truly involved. And if uh, it's employees, it's nice to know who the employees are that you're going to be dealing with. Also, when you're dealing with people on the shop floor or in your hospital ward or in a manufacturing uh, shop, um, do they know what you're there for and what Gemba is? So if you can give them some education on that in advance, that's certainly a good thing. And you should have some, uh, they should have some understanding of what your expectations are of them. You know, you're going to be asking questions, you know, the why, why not sort of scenario. You'll probably be doing brainstorming with them. You'll be asking them about processes that they have ownership in. So you want to have their, first of all, their buy-in, and also you want honest information coming out. Uh, and they also need to have trust that this isn't about them, that it's actually about the process and making things better for everyone. And probably the other thing that tends to get overlooked everywhere, um, <laughs> so I can't pick on a particular industry or private or public sector, is these things do take time and they take people away from the work that they want to do or need to do or being paid to do. So if you're going to slow down their process, um, you have to realize that there's always a balance against the demands of the workplace and your demands while you're doing your walk. Uh, and, you know, if you can bring in additional staff to help decompress the workload, that's fine because you're not going to get a lot of deep and valued information from people if they're thinking about how far behind you're putting them in their workday. So that's another important consideration. And, I, and people do forget that particular part. So planning together. If you have an agenda send it along. Uh, if you have a map of the process that you want to look at and they can have a copy of it, that's great. Um, 
you know, in planning, how can they be the most helpful? What key performance metrics are you trying to measure or get information from? Um, what's the outcome that you're trying to achieve? The more that they understand why you're there and what you're looking for, the better their information to you can be. Uh, I like this map. This basically is a business systems model, uh, and it uh, speaks to just about every process or groups of processes in virtually every organization. You have a series of inputs. If you're making uh, automobiles, then those inputs could be parts if you're an assembly plant. So chairs and nuts and bolts and tires and things like that. There's a variety of processes, obviously, in an assembly plant that puts the car together and your outputs then would be a finished product. And that finished product uh, should be the expectation, should meet the expectations that the customer is desiring. So it should be reliable, it should be the right color, uh, there should be less defects or no defects in that product. And in any good business system, uh, there should be a feedback mechanism from your customer uh, or from your, whether that customer is internal or external, uh, that provides feedbacks that you can take as another input to your process. So uh, it gives you an idea of, um, it gives you an idea of how you're doing basically. Uh, and that's critical in any business process. And within a business model like this, these processes can be continue, contiguous. They can, you know, one fall, flows right after the other. They can be discrete, and there's a handoff between one process and another. Uh, whenever there's a handoff process, uh, you know, or you finish one one process and then you give it to another one, there's a dependency that's that's built there, and in those dependencies, obviously, the second process can't proceed until the first process is done. And that uh, has a very strong possibility of generating waste in the system. So that's something that um, you need to consider when you're doing your Gemba walk. There's mainly eight types of waste, okay? Uh, there's basically defects in, crea in like correction and rework. Um, and types of rework waste can be, you know, the creation of a product or a service, um, but it doesn't really match the customer's requirements or, or what they want. So then there's rework that's involved in that. Um, in service activities, it could be, you know, it, it would certainly be a service that you're providing. And if it's not timely and, and what they need, then it's obviously not going to work well. And uh, you're going to have to fix that. Um, if you're providing education, uh, rework waste could include in, uh, inadequate education, poor training, or work instructions so that your customer uh, doesn't get the full value and you have to do some remediation to improve their uh, their uh, their training parts and then all of that equals waste it's extra time extra money uh, less efficiency and certainly less effectiveness another waste is overproduction um, overproduction is simply making more product than is required um, or providing more services than uh, than are required um, and that could be internally or external to the organization uh, one might be uh, an example might be that you're making uh, products and it's a just-in-time product so as you have demands to sell the product the products are being made uh, versus uh, an overproduction where you're just building a big inventory of product and then hoping that you sell it the other uh, another source of weight is is weight is waiting which all of us have done uh, and it's the idle time when you're waiting for processes, when you're waiting for the service, um, you know, if you're if you're waiting for an appointment and your appointment's at two and you don't get in till three, that's a waste of the system. Um, and some of those wastes can be caused by a variety of different things in your processes. It could be unbalanced workload, uh, so you may have uh, less employees working on a basically a mission critical part of what you're trying to uh, manufacture or deliver. Um, 
and obviously you know the handoff to the next process uh, in in the system isn't going to happen until they get this finished uh, different types of waiting waiting can be caused by breakdowns if you're in an assembly line setting or uh, you know, set up times that take longer than they're supposed to. So there's a variety of different things. So when you're looking at a workplace, uh, if people are sitting around waiting, whether it's internally or whether it's your customer waiting for his appointment, uh, that's an important piece of waste that you have to, uh, it certainly provides an opportunity to improve. Not utilizing employee ideas is, um, doesn't seem like that would be an obvious thing, but it certainly is. Uh, employees, people that are actually doing the work that are on the, on the ground, on the shop floor, uh, have a lot of really good ideas. Um, and so when you're trying to make improvements in the process, it's critical that you use those and you engage those staff members. Um, if you don't in include staff in, in the problem solving, you're not going to get their feedback and it's going to cause waste because they have the best understanding of the process you're trying to improve. Uh, the waste of transporting um, is really unnecessary movement of equipment, materials or what have you through the steps in the process. Anybody who's ever worked in an office can, can uh, see errors and transporting where they may have a fax machine that's at the far end of the office and everybody works at the other end. So uh, as soon as a fax comes in, some employee has to get up, walk across the shop floor to get that piece of paper. Um, that transportation cost is expensive. It's interrupting in the work, uh, in the work uh, place and uh, it takes time which is equal to a waste. You know, so movement of paperwork, electronic data, approvals especially are trans, can be transporting errors. Um, copies, copying information to people who don't need to really have, uh, really need to know uh, is uh, transporting information that uh, uh, generates waste. Inventory again generates waste. If you make, uh, if you're making widgets and you make more than you have a demand for, then you have to store it. Uh, they age in place. Their value may depreciate over time, and you have a holding cost because you have to build a warehouse around them. So inventory is uh, is certainly a place of waste that we see in a lot of industry. And sometimes inventory waste uh, occurs because. Uh, the industry may have been caught short at one point in time and being caught short, they react and say, well, instead of making, you know, a hundred pieces of uh, product, we're going to make 150 and then we won't get caught short again. But what happens is every month or every week that they make 150, they're growing an inventory of uh, equipment that they or parts that they're not selling or not utilizing, and then they're storing it. Motion, particularly human motion, is uh, is a type of waste that you may want to look for, and it's moving the movement of people that uh, don't add value to the process. So if people have to walk around a great deal to get what they need, uh, whether they're you know in a shipping department and they're going around getting different pieces of inventory, uh, if they have to walk a long way for each piece, then that's a waste of time. Uh, and if they have to do it over and over again, then there's also a redundant activity waste there that uh, you really shouldn't have to deal with. Extra processing. Uh, extra processing, processing is you know doing a task that's no longer needed. Maybe it's a check or a just in case type of thing that, well, I'm going to do this because just in case there's an error. Um, and it's really a, it's, it's an error of over-processing, and uh, it's probably mostly generated by lack of communication and lack of awareness. Extra processing steps get uh, in, included into, uh, into a lot of processes over history, and sometimes it can be as simple as redundant approvals, because at one point in the game, one particular person needed to have an approval of uh, a process and that may no longer be required. Uh, the system may have changed, the reporting processes may have changed. And extra copies, again, you know, that's extra processing and extra information that's not needed.
And while you're doing your Gemba walk, if you don't just determine key performance indicators or metrics that you can at least measure, uh, not only to get a baseline, but to um, see if any of the changes that you've made have caused an improvement or not, um, if you don't measure it, you're not going to know whether you made a difference one way or the other. So you need to decide what kind of data you want to collect. Um, I always uh, suggest that if you can, to collect continuous data. That's the data that lends itself to most of the common statistical tests that we do on data. You know, it's, um, it's really data that can be measured on a scale and broken down into smaller parts, and those smaller parts still have meaning. Um, you could have discrete data, <clears throat> but discrete data could be like a Likert scale. Uh, so there's only, a, you know, there's a one or a two or a three, but there's no such number as 2.5 in discrete data. Um, it can be counted and there are, there are statistical tests that help you analyze discrete data, <clears throat> but you need to know that you're dealing with it and you can't really apply continuous statistics to, uh, con continuous data statistics to uh, discrete data. You can also have attribute data where, uh, it provides a count of sorts, you know, number of deep effects uh, or the number of people who shop at a particular store. And that's, that's discrete data, uh, or pardon me, attribute data. You can calculate averages or you can rank uh, people with attribute data. And then I think the final type of data that you may want to look at is, uh, or could possibly be looking at is, uh, is basically attribute data, um, and an example of that would be uh, a good example. That would be a squash, you know, a squash ladder where players are ranked better than or or worse than uh, the player beside them, uh, or more accomplished. I guess is the better political answer. Uh, but it's important that that data is, uh, you know, you know what it is and know how to handle it. The other thing is. Um, when you're collecting data or when you're asking people to collect data, you need to give them clear instruction as to how, uh, how that data is to be collected because uh, too often people collect information. They collect data, but they can't turn it into information because it's not consistent. It's not collected in the same way. Um, it's fragmented, so there's different parts and uh, all of that uh, makes for a difficult analysis at the end of the day. What are the benefits of doing a Gemba walk? Obviously, by observing the process, um, you can obtain actual data on that process, um, and you can base your decision on facts, which is really what you want to do. You don't want to be relying on secondhand information. Um, you want to be, you know, it should be firsthand, uh, and it should be valid uh, across your processes. So that's the whole benefit of getting uh, down there. And again, when you do there, if you want, if you're going to do a Gemba walk, you know, go see where the issues are, ask why there's issues, and try and determine what the root cause of those issues are. And above all else, show respect for the people because that's really the important, uh, that's the important aspect. So if I was going to say what the key messages are today, uh, you really need to, if you to do a to do a good under, or to establish a good understanding of your workplace, walk the process. You know, be prepared. Bring information with you so that you don't have to. Uh, you can do some study ahead of time so that you have an understanding of what the process is. Uh, mind you, with the with the key understanding that you don't come with a preconceived solution. You're really there to explore and observe. Uh, talk to people, ask them what they feel the most important uh, aspects of the process are, where they see some of the issues and how they think they can make it better and observe the process that you're examining, you know, firsthand so you can see what's going on. When you're doing that, you can imagine what the process should be and again, respect people. The um, 
What we have, uh, another uh, aspect is that uh, the, of, of our company is that Canada, there is a, a Canada Ontario job grant. So if you are looking for training costs or if you're interested in training your workforce in lean techniques, there's an opportunity to, uh, to access funding. Um, we need to be a private company and not funded by the government in this particular instance. Uh, and that application, like most government applications, is, uh, we can certainly help you with it to make sure that it's filled out appropriately. The other thing that PACE provides is a deferred payment option for government and nonprofit organizations that can help you better fit training costs into your budget. Uh, we'd be happy to discuss that with you at your uh, convenience. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, so you can look at previous uh, you can look at previous webinars. Uh, we record them and we basically put them up there. So if there's something that you want to review in the discussion, uh, this one provided will provide you with an opportunity to uh, to review it uh, at your leisure. We also have some uh, testimonials from our customers. Um, so if you want to hear what our clients are saying about us, uh, you can go to YouTube and find out. And as I said earlier in the presentation, there are two uh, lean green belt sessions that are coming in the near future. One is May 30th and 31st, and the second one is in September, the 18th and the 19th. And if you want to uh, participate in those training programs, uh, you can register online at www.yourpace.ca events. So there is an upcoming webinar called Managing Change uh, that's happening in June. And uh, I think finally, if you need to contact us or have a desire, here is our contact information. I'll just leave that up on the screen for a moment. And it's also part of our recorded uh, process. Anyway, from Pace, I want to thank you for attending our webinar series. Um, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. And I think at this point, I'll take the opportunity to uh, open the floor to questions. If anyone has any questions, um, I'll monitor the uh, I'll monitor that part of the screen and uh, be happy to. Do my best to answer anything that you bring forward. So are there any questions out there? Okay, then I, uh, I don't see any questions coming to the forefront. So um, in the true uh, spirit of lean, uh, again, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and uh, I'll let you get back to what you're doing uh, in your workplace. Thanks a lot for attending and I hope to see you at future, uh, future sessions. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.